The European Union introduced a very, very large and significant climate package today in its uh, parliament. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Akshat Rathi. He's the climate and energy reporter for Bloomberg based in the UK uh, about that plan. So welcome to the interview, Akshat. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks. So this plan, it's called Fit for 55. So I guess the idea is to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions 55% from 1990 levels by 2030. Can you tell us what's in the plan? So uh, it's a huge plan. So I'm going to give you some of the highlights, but there's a lot in there. Um, one big thing which um, many uh, viewers might be aware of is that Europe has an emissions trading system. And so uh, one lever is going to expand that emissions trading system from the industries and sectors it covers today to more sectors, including uh, aviation and shipping, which has never been done anywhere in the world. Um, and so we'll see uh, the coverage of that system be, uh, be expanded. Of course, this is happening at the time when prices, carbon prices have been rising. They're at about 55 euros a ton and uh, are expected to rise even further. So the new sectors that come into it will start to feel the, the higher brunt of those carbon prices pretty soon. Um, it's also got uh, investments that are being made in um, trying to ensure that people who will suffer inevitably from higher carbon prices are taken care of through a social fund. And so there's going to be uh, something like an 80 billion dollar fund that will be available to dole out money to affected uh, regions in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, there is uh, a carbon border levy or carbon border adjustment mechanism as they call, uh, which will also be implemented. Again, it sort of connects to the carbon price because that carbon price is rising, which means domestic industry is paying a price, which obviously non-domestic industry, which is exporting goods is not paying. And so this carbon border levy would, um, uh, would try and balance that where if you are exporting from China or from the US and your carbon intensity is higher, then you have to pay the same amount of carbon price that domestic industry is paying. And uh, it has uh, you know, an energy efficiency goal that is uh, higher than what previously had been set. Uh, there is a goal to increase forest cover so that uh, you're, you'll have more carbon sinks, uh, your, your carbon sink will grow and the list goes on. I mean, it's, it's a huge package. Now, I understand that uh, there's a lot of controversy around some of these the parts of the package. Force uh, would be one. Uh, and another one is uh, there's a just, just transition uh, section in there. Can you tell us about that a little bit? So the just transition section this has been talked about for quite some time. And, and you can think of things like, um, uh, and they, in some places, they've actually also implemented that, whether it's through the EU or through EU members. So one example that comes to mind is in Spain, uh, they turned coal mining down. Uh, in, they essentially shut coal mining. Um, and now very soon, they'll shut all the coal power plants that exist in, in Spain. Um, and when the mining region um, had to go through this transition, uh, the Spanish government put in, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, I, I might get the number wrong here, but a uh, hundred million euro plus uh, sum into the region as an investment to figure out ways in which that region can uh, find new, new uh, sources of uh, living. And that kind of thing will happen in other places, Poland, Germany, these all places have coal mining as a, a big part of their um, economy and uh, coal will have to be phased out in, in this plan pretty quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, the point of the fund is that it could be used for other purposes as well, where, wherever the need arises. Um, I wouldn't say it's controversial. I think it's, it's, it's a way to manage the controversies that may come from trying to push this climate package. Now, I understand that uh, like the energy in, the, in, in Germany, uh, one of the things that slowed it down and slowed down the decarbonization of Germany's electric, electricity system is those coal, that coal industry. I mean, it's the Germany, the government there has found it very hard to, to trans, it's the, um, 
you know, the, uh, the labor force, the workers. Uh, that's been a big political problem. And I imagine that it has to be the case in other countries like Poland and, and as you mentioned, Spain. So do you think that uh, having that kind, that kind of a fund will, will uh, solve these, uh, the problem uh, of political opposition uh, sooner than otherwise might have happened? Yes, I certainly think that that's an option. I don't know if it will solve all the problems, but the fact that there is a fund and it's a significant sized part uh, gives you some, some options to try and tackle these problems. Now, how many other problems may come through is, is hard to tell. You know, uh, if uh, the EU has to decarbonize, it will have to move away from natural gas as well eventually. Uh, what do you replace that uh, with? Is it green hydrogen? Is it you know biomethane? Uh, how are you going to develop those? Which are the which are the jobs and in the industry that will be affected? It, there is a lot of uncertainty around that, uh, but having a part certainly helps. Well, I'm uh, I'm impressed and and uh, a little bit inter well I'm interested in the the 2030 date because there's a, it seems like there's a lot to do in just nine years uh, yeah. and it'll take a little while I assume to get some of these programs up up and running is the is the date uh, a little problematic uh, I, I mean, that is the date has been determined by the science. Uh, so if we are going to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, we have to cut emissions by about half globally, which means rich, richer countries have to go uh, sooner. If anything, um, from a science perspective, many argue that the goal should be 65% reduction. So the UK's goal, for example, for 2030 is a 68% reduction on 1990 levels. Um, and so, um, you know, you can't argue with physics here. You can't argue with what's up in the atmosphere. And uh, this is a way to manage, uh, to figure out a way to uh, get there, uh, even though it looks ambitious. Uh, it's, it's important that we do if we want to avoid the worst effects of uh, climate change, which will likely cost a lot more in the future. Now, I, uh, just to wrap up our interview, uh, Akshat, I understand that uh, not everybody's happy with this uh, plan. And uh, folks like uh, Greenpeace, for instance, say that it didn't go far enough. Uh, how uh, widespread, how vocal are the critics? Um, I mean, the critics are on both sides, right? You have critics on the industry side, you have critics on certain governments, you know, Hungary's, Hungary uh, is, is unhappy with the plan. Um, and, and there are going to be a bunch of negotiations that will happen uh, before the plan becomes law and is actually implemented. Um, and of course, there's, there's uh, opposition from environmental groups that it doesn't go far enough. Uh, you can't make everybody happy. Uh, it is clearly one of the most ambitious packages that currently exists. Whether it does uh, the justice by the science is not, uh, you know, you can always argue it does not because we've let emissions reductions to, to so late. Uh, but there is no doubt that what the EU is trying to do, it certainly puts it in a leadership position globally. Akshat, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for your insights. Great to be here. Thanks.